All right, I have no disclosure. So uh, we'll start off with a, with a case right off the bat. A 66-year-old woman who presents with uh, multiple atherosclerotic risk factors um, uh, and, and non-stemming. You can see on the diagnostic right coronary angiography on the left, she has severe calcified disease involving the ostium, the mid-vessel, uh, throughout the distal vessel. Uh, we predilated this, and we felt like there was good expansion uh, of the predilation balloons to implant stents. Stents were implanted throughout the vessel. Uh, there was a resistant lesion in the mid-segment uh, that required um, high-pressure non-compliant balloon dilation, and our subsequent angiography looks like this. Uh, you can see there's perforation within the, the mid-stented -seg uh, segment uh, with myocardial blushing and then a little bit of a superior washout there. So the LS classification would, would uh, label this a type 2 um, uh, uh, coronary perforation where you see pericardial and myocardial blushing. A type 1 would be essentially a vessel disruption, uh, extra luminal crater that, that is formed uh, at the site of injury without the frank extravasation. And, and the type 3, the, the, those types that have essentially free-flowing blood into the pericardial uh, space or uh, spilling into a cavity. The mechanisms of, of these injuries uh, can occur uh, with aggressive wire and catheter manipulation, especially in a vessel that's already disrupted. Um, of course, atherectomy can, can lead to these uh, complications as well, but the more common um, mechanism is really oversizing of your balloons and stents um, um, uh, during therapy. Another important one that's not recognized uh, is uh, balloon rupture itself. And so if you inflate the balloon uh, to high pressure, the actual hydraulic force of tissue of the material of the balloon rupturing can lead to vessel rupture as well. Um, and so you have to be careful with this, especially in very calcified uh, disease. Mortality can be high. This is not recognized, and if you do not move quickly. So as my fellows know, uh, I'm always moving, moving very rapidly, as Manos does as well. Um, and, and, this, and, and this is why it's important to do so for, for these uh, types of situations. Now, prolonged balloon inflation it, it remains the mainstay here. There are two schools of thought here. Uh, one is to inflate a balloon proximal to the, to the site of injury. And the other one is to, re to inflate the balloon at the site of injury. And I tend to, to do the latter at the site of injury, not high-pressure balloon inflation. This is meant to just occlude the, the injury. And so it's a well-sized uh, balloon at nominal pressure, making sure there's no leak around it. Very important in these situations to be very concise with your uh, staff. Call for a pericardiocentesis kit. Make sure you have adequate help in the room. Call for echo. If you don't use them, you don't use them. But you have them available and, and, and uh, quickly um, can use them if needed. Uh, crystalloid bolus. This is important. You have to increase the central venous pressure uh, inside the heart to counter the effect of accumulating uh, fluid that, that uh, can be going on um, um, with, with uh, coronary ruptures. Um, hang your vasopressor of choice. Dopamine, levofed, whatever you want. Hang if you, if you, don't, you don't need to, to initiate it if not needed, but hang, have it uh, ready to, uh, to initiate as needed uh, based on the patient's hemodynamics. And then make sure that your staff is uh, well-versed with where your cover stents uh, are uh, in the lab. And control the chaos, not only within yourself, uh, but also uh, within all, your, your, um, uh, all the members in the lab, your fellows, your cath lab staff. Make sure that there's a single voice and that orders are being um, uh, uh, voiced uh, succinctly. The next question is whether you have to perform pericardiocentesis. And if the answer to that is yes, remember that um, this is blood loss. And if you cannot control uh, the, the large volume of blood that can, can pour out into the pericardium very quickly, uh, it's important to remember that uh, uh, a perforation can then lead, or excuse me, hypotension from a perforation and from tamponade can then lead to uh, a hemorrhagic shock if you're just removing blood um, uh, over and over in these patients. So typically what I do is I have someone else get access in, in a femoral vein uh, or in a jugular vein and that the, the blood that you're aspirating from the pericardial space gets auto automatically transfused into that uh, venous sheath. Uh, in the jugular is the same process, okay? Now, this is a point of, of controversy. Some people uh, feel strongly or have a lower threshold uh, to uh, reverse the antithrombotic effects that you've had on the, um, that you've initiated on the patient. And I am at the other end of the spectrum. I think you should keep the patient anticoagulated, especially if you're gonna auto-transfuse this blood. You do not want any clot uh, being uh, transfused into the uh, systemic circulation. There are other reasons to maintain anticoagulated um, in these patients, and, and this is a good example. This is our case from the beginning. Um, and so what we did, uh, this was when I was a fellow, uh, we balloon occluded at the site of injury, and we reversed the patient. 
And the problem is that uh, now you're setting up uh, yourself for a thrombotic occlusion of the vessel. And this is precisely what happened. We spent the next hour and a half trying to get clot out of the vessel and, and getting flow back and trying to balance that with reopening up the, the injured vessel. And the patient had a sizable infarct related to not to the perforation but to the thrombotic uh, effect after reversing the antithrombotics. So I would avoid that as much as possible, irrespective of how of um, how bad uh, an injury you've caused in the vessel. So this is another case of uh, just uh, my partner's case. Uh, this is my partner's case from last month, uh, a patient who had stents implanted in the mid-LED that were under-expanded and uh, presented with uh, rest angina and uh, severe uh, restenosis in the mid-segment. This is a rotation atherectomy with a 1.75 burr within the stented segment, had a good ablation result. And uh, because there was a resistant lesion still there, high-pressure balloon inflation was performed. Uh, and the non-compliant balloon ruptured. Um, uh, when you puffed, there was a, a clear injury um, at that segment, and within 30 seconds, patient became very tachycardic, hypotensive, cardiac arrest uh, happened at that point. And this is where things have to go very quickly because your balloon has now ruptured. It's not like you can just inflate the balloon again to get uh, control of your injury. Now you have to get that balloon out, get a new balloon, and, and get things moving quickly. And so the first thing you should do is call for help. If, you don't, if you're in there by yourself, call a fellow to come in. Call your colleague to come in. Someone needs to uh, control the chest while you get your balloon ready. And so a single order should go out to each of your staff members. New balloon for, for one staff member. Pericarcentesis kit for another staff member. Epinephrine bolus for another one. Crystalloid bolus for another one. Remember, increase the CVP. Increasing CVP will get you some time, buy you some time to counter affect the, the pericardial fusion that's forming. And uh, you have to be comfortable doing these sorts of things, that there's in, inflating balloons, wiring, um, uh, putting a needle in the chest with, uh, during chest compressions, as we did in this case. So, uh, and we also auto-transfused uh, this patient. After about 10 minutes of proximal balloon occlusion, which is how my partner uh, handles these, uh, you have this angiogram. So you can see that the perforation was much larger, actually, and much more wide open um, initially with the initial injury. But this is after uh, 10 minutes of balloon uh, occlusion. The ACT at this point is about 2.30. Um, no extra antithrombotics were given. And the decision was made to uh, implant a, a cover stent in this point. And so this is what the cover stent looks like um, uh, in the angiography on the left. And it's important to remember that the graft masters can be delivered uh, via a six French uh, guide. And so you don't need to upsize. Uh, you can use the, uh, the, the six French that you're working with. This is another mechanism of, of, of MI, not only that patient that gets reversed and gets a, a thrombotic um, complication, but when you cover uh, uh, the, the injury, you can also lose large branches. And here, a large septal was lost and a large diagonal was lost uh, that led to uh, paraprocedural MI. The patient did well outside of that. Another important lesson is, is to also uh, realize that not all LS type 3 perforations require covered stent implantation. It is still worth, especially with the, the MI complications you can get from side branch loss, it's important to still try to do um, a balloon occlusion and see if you can manage this conservatively without implanting a covered stent. This is uh, actually in, this is my first month of um, out of fellowship, uh, had this uh, horrific case. Uh, declined or was denied uh, cabbage and had um, a horrible calcific disease. This was proximal LED balloon uh, rupture. It's actually a cutting balloon that ruptured here. Uh, why I did not do atherectomy was um, uh, beyond me, but when you think about it, you should do it because this is the things that can happen uh, by doing aggressive balloon inflation. So what I did was uh, a pro a prolonged balloon occlusion, every now and then uh, deflating the balloon to get flow down the vessel and trying to avoid clot from forming. A very just a brief uh, deflation of the balloon to, to promote that would be good. And you can see that there's a little bit of a, of a thrombotic cap at the site of injury, but no frank extravasation anymore. I, re, um, uh, I had the surgeons relook at him, and they again uh, denied or declined uh, taking him to the OR. So I brought him back three days later and uh, stented him. And you can see at three days, there's a little cap, a pseudoaneurysm that's formed there, a little bit bigger than before. Um, but I went ahead and stented that with a, a non-covered stent, and you can see there's a flow into that a little cap that I left alone. Patient came back five months later uh, for restenosis of the circumflex stent, and you can see there's a walled-off pseudoaneurysm there that uh, I wanted to go ahead and leave alone. Uh, he's an end-stage renal diabetic. I felt like the restenosis rates were going to be much higher, and so I managed him uh, conservatively in that respect. 
So when, when these um, complications arise, it's important to be clear and concise with instructions uh, to your staff. Control the chaos, again, very, very, very important. Move quickly and call for help early uh, to avoid um, um, getting the patient in trouble. All right. Thank you, Mike. That was excellent.